Well, I was, it was very pleasant to, to hear such a lot of sound criticism on this side. <laughs> Time not, not on Soviet Union, but on <laughs> United States and Great Britain. And I share it and I could add some things to it <laughs> as well. Uh, but we have our concerns here and a lot of things are being done. Uh, here we are not completely satisfied. And I think when you speak about the right to oppose, well, we could rephrase it as right for criticism, which is cherished in our country. I think it is very important, and we consider it to be very important. But at the same time, I don't think it is enough. And the main problem is, and there is no simple answer to this problem. How, how to really make people participate in decisions beginning from the grassroots. Of course, I have some grave doubts on how it will done, be done in the United States, how, for instance, the steel worker can influence the major decisions of U.S. steel or even the editorial policy of Washington Post, but uh, I Is see so a certain, system? certain search, search for it here in this country, and How I think it's a very, a very, very sound development. Can I just ask one question, really, from the British-American point of view? Because when I was over here nine months ago, it was just after an article that appeared in Time. I'm sorry, it was the sort of rival concern. Uh, which was entitled Them and Us. And it was about a British firm called Rubri Owen. And it wasn't in any way malicious, and I'm sure it wasn't meant to be. But what it described was a situation in a medium-sized British firm, which it described how the uh, chairman and managing director, which was originally a family business, so lived in his very nice Tudor house, and his children were taken uh, to prep school in the mornings in a car and how he had his recreation at weekends and so on. And then it described what happened with the senior shop steward in the factory and how he lived in a small local authority house with no garden and his two children went to the uh, Victorian primary school and he went off to the pub and so on. Now, everywhere I went in the States, whether it was in Wall Street, whether it was, I was a visiting fellow of Yale at the time, the students there talked to me about it on the West Coast, they talked to me about it, and everybody said, but how can you run a country if you have this situation of them and us? Now, is it true to say that in the United States you don't have a situation of them and us? There is them and us in the United States, but it's much easier for them to become us or whatever. I mean, the, in other words, matters of birth, accent, and all that kind of thing are far less decisive or are at least perceived as far less decisive. And therefore, peanut farmers become presidents and... We have a hell of a lot of <laughs> mythology than you. And the ancient mythology of uh, Britain is that of a class structure. And the equally and much more powerful mythology of the United States is of uh, equality, mobility. And on the whole, uh, uh, the belief in both countries is strong, but if anything, our capacity for uh, illusion is greater than yours. You have read your Marx very well, Ken, if you believe that mythologies can be sustained for any length of time without a basis in fact. <laughs> there must be some sort of basis. <laughs> Well, there's a little mythology everywhere, and I certainly wouldn't I mean, deny that. The important that. thing about this discussion is, is that we, it seems to me, we all recognize that there is a problem of ensuring that the, the ordinary uh, factory hand, and uh, whether it's a man or a woman, and, and the person in the street should have a say. We should encourage this participation. It's how you do it. How to have some form of continuous association, either in the streets or in the factories that we... We need to look at and develop, and I, I think in the factories it becomes very much a question of the trade union operation. This is what trade unionism is about. It's not just about concluding a contract on wages and working conditions. It is about uh, representing people and, and seeking to secure the freedoms which Ted Heath mentioned, the, the freedom of, uh, from, from uh, unemployment and the freedom from insecurity and so on. 
These are vital factors which people want to want to do something about, and they should be encouraged to do something about. Them. We were to continue our talks later in the evening in Newfane, our neighboring town, eight or nine miles away. Newfane is the prettiest village in New England, which means the United States. It has also two superb inns where most of our guests were housed. Never before had it had such a concentration of cabinet ministers and former prime ministers. And in the finest Vermont tradition, no one paid any particular attention. There's probably an art in arranging dinner guests, but it can't be as recondite as my wife makes it appear. She leaves a place down at the end of the table for Henry Kissinger, who of course was Secretary of State when we had this meeting. Henry is being disciplined for arriving late. Our guests started on the topics we've been discussing during the afternoon. Our leader is a lot of good at it like me. Well, I not only remember the discussion, but I, but I remember the instruction as to who was to start it. So as soon as you've had a chance to look at the menu, I'm going to ask uh, Jack Jones to pick up the uh, discussion of this afternoon, uh, start the conversation on the not on the uh, negative. Uh, form in which we all rejoice this afternoon as to how difficult the problem of the individual is in a world of great organization, but in the affirmative sense of uh, what we do about it. And, uh, well, I, I think we're living in a time of very considerable change in this respect. People are, working people are more educated. They, 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 even, they managed to watch television for one thing and see Kenneth Galbraith well, and take an interest in what he has to say. Certainly nobody is going to deny uh, the impact anyway, of that. Th th there is a, a, a new trend in, in, in the sense that people question authority. They question authority in trade unions, they question authority of management, they question authority um, of governments. It's how you can apply that constructively. You see, We've learned that not all brains lie with the top. There's a collective experience that's necessary. Uh, and uh, even in terms of product, the, take a motor car, the person who participates in the manufacture of a motor car, these days often will drive that motor car. He's very proud of the, the product he's a part of. But he will have, a, he'll have views to express about the performance the, and maybe the the construction of the car that ought to flow up to management. And in, this is what we mean now by, by uh, industrial democracy, to involve this expertise of the shop floor up to the level of, of management. Uh, we in Britain, the trade unionists in Britain, for the most part, not everyone, uh, feel that it, it will add to the enrichment of the life of the worker. You feel a part of much more a part of management decision making and in the process it can add to efficiency. Now how far you can apply that to society I don't know. Can I ask you this Arthur? I mean my impression is that 
you see, what Jack said is true of a lot of West Europe at the moment. You've got you've got Sweden, you've got Holland, you've got Norway, you've got Denmark, you've got Experiment. Germany, all engaged in this great move towards what's called a national democracy. It takes different shapes. It okay. doesn't always take the same That's shape right. as it does in Britain, but it's a universal movement in Western Europe, and there's even the EEC attempt now to lay down what they call a European company statute, which requires union representation, not perhaps again in the form that everybody's happy with, but nevertheless, the move is all in the same direction. I mean, my impression is that the United States trade union movement is nothing like as pulled into the center of policy making as it now is in Western Europe. And why this is, I'm not quite clear, except that it seems to me that the trade union movement in the States has been astonishingly politically ineffective. Or Maybe it's it taken, wanted to be. It's I don't taken know. different forms. It's an invention in politics that have taken different forms. There hasn't been the relationship, for example, between the uh, labor, American labor movement and even the Democratic Party. Uh, comparable to the organic relationship that exists between the TUC and the, and the Labour Party oh, in I England. Sure. I mean, the, there is also a feeling, which may be right or may not be right, that the more the Labour business and government get involved in a collusive relationship and settle decisions among themselves, you get into the situ a situation of a corporate society where these decisions are taken to the expense of uh, all the None. You, we only have 28% of the labor force in unions in this country. So that the, uh, which on the one hand means all the fears of trade union tyranny are nonsense, but which on the other hand means that the trade unions cannot legitimately claim to represent the, the entire working force. And the problems of, of, of as I say, collusion between big business, big labor, and a subservient and acquiescent government are, uh, that's a, a serious question, which the proponents of Professor Galbraith's income policy will answer for us. But, uh, with, with great respect, you're begging one of the questions there, aren't you? Because you're saying a subservient government. Uh, we've got uh, less than 50% of our workers in trade unions. That's also true. Um, but if a government is going to deal with anybody at all, then the only people it can deal with is the organized trade unions. But in doing that, and in deal with them, dealing with employers, then it has got a responsibility to represent the consumers, as we said earlier on today, but also all of those people who aren't, in fact, in unions. What worries me more than anything is how do we create a situation in which the individual who's got the initiative and uh, got the incentive will, in fact, do things for himself. They will ask me about the individual, and that's the thing which most concerns me today. This comes down as a practical matter to how the small firm, the independent entrepreneur, can make his way against the large enterprise or against the... Or how the worker can get a job. Or the... Uh, Yes, and against the bureaucracy and against the tax system and against uh, all those things which discourage him from doing it at this moment. Against every sort of planning regulation, against every sort of restrictive practice, against every sort of activity. I mean, I'm so the first consideration is a job tag. Huh? How do we ensure that everybody has the right yeah. to a job? Yes, but that, that is, is an ally question because if you have individuals who get the opportunity of doing this for themselves, they create jobs for other people. Uh, I'm not against the small businessman, and, and maybe there's a case for ex encouraging it in some of the, the craft trades. But in fact, the idea is a bit outmoded, you know, in, in, in so many areas of industry. You, 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 quite, quite frankly, the small businessman couldn't compete with, with modern mass production. And it's, it's, the, it's the big mass production units where the the impersonalization. Occurs. I suppose it's the difference between remote. production and services. But in services, the small entrepreneur still has a role oh, well, in, in, in still keeping the affirmative tone, which we more or less successfully uh, tried to sustain. But what, what's the most important thing that needs to be done to affirm the position of the of the individual consumer. It won't work like that. Um, you can't really create an organization of consumers. They don't work that way. Their common interests aren't sufficient for that. 
But what you can do, and I think must do, is to give them a bit of muscle in the sense of uh, the kind of expert backing that Ralph Darendorf was talking about in another context. And let me look at three sorts of consumer interest. One sort is the straight desire not to be exploited, in other words, not to have a situation in which you could see the two sides of industry coming together and simply passing costs <coughs> along to the consumer. And if the consumer is helpless, that situation can't be resisted. Secondly, you've got a consumer interest vis-a-vis -vis government itself. And government, whether it's, we were saying that this afternoon, whether it's central or local, has lengthened the lines of communication, in some cases beyond the point where it communicates at all, has lost touch to a very great extent with a man and woman in the street, and tends to work increasingly through layer after layer of bureaucracy to the point where its voice isn't even heard clearly by the people it's meant to be addressing. And I think that many of the mistakes that have been made, not least by architects and planners, would not have been made if there had been the kind of consultation with the human being at the end of the process that Jack Jones was talking about earlier in the case of industry where he wants the worker and the plant to be consulted. And yet we haven't developed really any very effective techniques for doing this except after the thing has happened. After it's happened, we deal with the protests. Before it's happened, we've got no effective machinery for trying to avoid the protests before it happens. And you asked me for a constructive view. Well, I'll give you two. And I think that in the case of civil servants, no civil servant should take up his post or should be promoted until he's spent at least a period of time at what you might call the shop front, dealing with the individual, either approaching him for unemployment benefit or approaching him for a pension or whatever it may be, so that he or she has a real sense of the public with which he or she is meant to deal, and to which in the end they're the servants. And at least in our country that happens very little, far less than it should be. Than Surely, is there any nadirism in England, I mean the use of the lawsuit as a means of consumer challenge, and anything that is results in a court decision automatically applies, therefore, to 100%. Nothing like it is in the States, but mm. the, the pressure of the consumer movement, and here again the parallel with the trade union movement is not, not bad, um, is of course on statutes. In other words... The, te the technique, in addition to statutes, the technique of the lawsuit yeah. is, a, is a useful one. It is a useful one, but it's not my No, not the lawsuit. Hey, Shirley, can I try another one? Mm -hmm. um, I w I've spent... 12 hours listening to this high-flown verbiage about uh, problem solving and it's returning. Uh, has it hasn't it been nearly 12? Seems, seems it. And returning it to the people. Uh, I've heard one mention of the only medium or uh, only media that, that uh, the people read, uh, television and newspapers. And I, it really quite appalls me that this group of heavy thinkers uh, haven't thought about the uh, the public education uh, uh, techniques that we've used in this country with some success, I think. Uh, and, come on, uh, reform the British press. <clears throat> well, you're... It's all so fine over here. I, I'm not too sure that it's fine over in Britain. I'm talking about television. Uh, 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 huh? Well, it's my personal observation. I don't think the British press, however bad it can be, should learn very much from American press. <laughs> I think that's right. What's your problem with the American press? Oh, we have a lot of them. <laughs> For starters. Hmm? Well, uh, many, many political things, how they were handled. And I have my observation in general if we switch to this subject that the sensationalism which goes quite contrary to the needs of public education, such stress upon violence, upon many other things, which is, has become a sort of public education of a very negative kind, I think, in this country. And although there are exceptions, there are good articles, some papers, but if you, you take it as a whole, especially, well, 
these papers which have the widest circulation, maybe. Of course we can't. I hope to achieve the balance and impartiality attained by Pravda and Izvestia in these matters, but we do our best. Uh, well, maybe you should, should learn a little bit from them as well. Can I ask you a question? I mean, you've got a great tradition in the States of what used to be called muckraking journalism. And I suppose at the highest level, one might describe the Watergate business as the very highest kind of muckraking journalism. I mean, in a sense, the press became the loyal opposition over that. What I want to ask is, at what point does the press have a greater responsibility towards matters that are crucial to the well-being of its society, or does it always have a greater responsibility to its readership, to give the readership what it may want? Well, I think it's one of the most interesting problems the press has is uh, what is its role in society. And I think that there are certain things we can do and try to do, and certain things we really probably can't and shouldn't uh, because there are limitations to what we can do. And there are limitations of time, of space, of, of the degree of sophistication of the reporters that are handling these subjects. And there are all sorts of, of constrictions. Uh, Walter Lippmann used a very good phrase once. Uh, he said, he was making the point that the press couldn't replace institutions. Uh, that it's that its duty, that its obligation was to inform as best it could, and that by doing this, it was in effect what he called a restless searchlight in the dark, illuminating here and there. Uh, that if you call attention to problems in in a an intelligent way. Uh, and get the facts to people that then institutions do really have to take over. And I would say that the Watergate instance is an instance of that because uh, what the press did was to keep the issue alive while the institutions were not working. Secretary Kissinger is arriving. Yes, I've been on the plane. You can now arrive at clearing the Well, Secretary, there's been a orientate towards the sun. Well, you thought you would be lonesome if you didn't have some television cameras. <laughs> uh, and so you will not be lonesome. Now I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to you, Ted. Uh, what's, uh, <laughs> Whatever it may be. <laughs> what are you turning over? I'm turning over. I'm turning over to you now sh to shift the question of how does the press serve, help, hurt in informing on the complex and technical issues which have to do with, for example, a large issue like your entry into the common market. The last time I spoke on this subject, Kay Graham walked out. <laughs> Henry, I hate to tell you, I don't even remember that. <laughs> well, I think you've made it up. You had a dinner party, but I didn't know you did. No, no, no. I think that yeah. <laughs> we've, we've been arguing about the press in various aspects and so on, and uh, the media as well. I would have thought, broadly speaking, that uh, on foreign policy, the press does a better job than it does on many other aspects of international life. Because uh, in most countries, at any rate, there is still a general agreement between political parties that foreign affairs is something which ought to be kept out of the ordinary dogfight and um, ought to be dealt with on a rather higher level than most of the current discussion in the press or in Parliament. 
Uh, now, of course, it can be that foreign policy does at times become so entangled in domestic affairs that it's very difficult for them to do this. But it does raise the basic question, well, is it a good thing to have the whole of foreign policy discussed in the, in the press? Um, I think it is a, a difficult issue. Uh, but I think that it has to be resolved in our country, which is really very unlike yours. We do not have a parliamentary democracy. And to some extent, we don't have the questioning devices that exist in parliament or the, the royal commissions uh, or, the, or the, the devices you have to question the government or in fact the ability to make the government fall if the people want to. So you have to start from the fact that we have a different problem. Uh, and in this country, for a long time, I think the press was not skeptical enough and did not report enough. And I certainly don't think that in the early days of Vietnam, enough people were reporting what was really going on. In Vietnam, we were taking the official version of it much too, much too literally. Uh, I think that when you say that there are government secrets, we all know there are, and, and I think that it is the view of the press in this country that it is up to the government to keep those secrets. But that uh, once one of them leaks, uh, that it really does more, much more harm than good to then say we want to get it back, and you all have to agree not to publish it. Uh, I know that the Official Secret Act, Official Secrets Act seems to work in England, but I feel that it would be very damaging here. I think that the government has... Great criticism in England, I think, a review. I think the, the government... commitment to change. The government has put in new proposals to change yeah, But, but there are other criticisms from both points of view, that in fact the existing act is not effective in dealing with breaches of of uh, security, which matter. But from the point of view of the parliamentary system, you see, you have a security question. The Prime Minister can stand up and say, this matter has been raised, but I must assure the House that this is a matter of security. And the Parliament will not press the Prime Minister on that. And he will say, I'm perfectly prepared to tell the leader of the opposition in the usual way, under Privy Council, the whole of the facts about this and the lead of the opposition comes along with his room directly after question time, he says, look, this is the whole situation. And then Parliament says, this is a matter of national security, and we are not going to expose all of this in public. Now, take another example, take Northern Ireland. I don't think many people in Britain are in doubt that a very large amount of the coverage given by television and by radio to the IRA in Northern Ireland has impeded to an enormous extent the ability of the forces to deal with the IRA. No doubt about it at all. And what that, is, what that has meant is that a large number of civilian lives have been lost and forces' lives have been lost. <coughs> Why should the television coverage have been impeded? Because television takes the view that if they can get a secret interview, so-called secret interview, uh, with the IRA um, in some back street in Belfast or London Derry, then they do that, they will not reveal where the IRA are operating. And it gives the IRA the opportunity on television of putting across a speech. Television is, I mean, BBC is better intelligence service than British government? Well, to the extent that the IRA will send a message to the BBC saying, uh, if you meet such a man uh, in such a place, such a time, then you will be taken unbeknown and blindfolded to another place. And there, we will give an interview on television or on radio and the conditions are of course that you don't uh, reveal this in any case you're applying for it you won't know where you're going and if you do reveal it your life is in danger because we will take jolly good care that you're bumped off well, after anyway, it seems to me that, that governments abide by a set of unwritten rules about how they behave now if you take one historic example where governments didn't obey that set of unwritten rules it was the the case of the British government at the time of Suez. 
because the, the matter was not an, a, an issue which came to Cabinet. It was resolved at Cabinet level. It was resolved by a much smaller group of ministers who, in effect, concealed from the Cabinet what they were intending to do. Now, I think the press was not wrong to pick up the Suez issue and to fight the government on it. And I think the press has a right, in a sense, to break the rules if government itself, in a democracy, breaks the rules. Yes, but if you go back to Suez, and you say the press broke the rules. The reason wasn't that they believed the cabinet hadn't been informed about the decisions. In actual fact, of course, the cabinet was fully informed about the decisions. The, 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 press, the press took this view because they were against this particular venture. Well, that's an also a point. I, I'm, I'm, when I get to Henry Kissinger, I want him to make the difference between what he would like to have now that he's in power, as distinct from uh, five years hence when he's a Harvard professor again. <laughs> It's, uh, <laughs> it's, complicated <laughs> it's complicated from the point of view of analysis. And I think the first part you have to do, uh, divide up is the defense foreign affairs aspect from the domestic aspect, insofar as you can have that division. And here, I think you are dealing with confidentiality as compared with what I would call security. Now, on confidentiality, I take the view that a government is just as entitled to be able to discuss policies with its uh, administrators, with the civil service and its colleagues, as any other organization in the country is. Now, I do not find that the press accept this. In other words, if uh, Kay found that one of her senior executives after every board meeting was going out and telling, telephoning the New York Times and telling them what had happened, she really wouldn't be very amused. And yet the press takes it for granted that a civil servant ought to be able to do this and ought to be able to ring up the press and say, well, there was a meeting in the cabinet today in which there was a row between so-and-so and so-and-so and you ought to know all about this. Or when there's things in, in a private organization and a publicly elected, democratically accountable... I don't accept this. Oh, I, I think there is. We used to have those arguments. We probably, I insisted, we had, and Kennedy insisted in publishing the documents, all, the State Department predicted all sorts of terrible consequences. Some of these had to do with Thailand and some with uh, China. Documents were published, had absolutely no consequences at all. The mention of well, Thailand allows me to ask the former Premier of Thailand what rule he would invoke on... Why it depends on the state on, this, uh, on the responsibility of the press. The press in, in the United States, of course, are different from uh, the press in England, and it's, as regard the Thai press, they're, they're unbelievably uh, ir uh, irresponsible. So, my rule is never, give to, never to give uh, information that affects national security or national interest. They'll invent it. If you don't give it to them, but then you can always deny. <laughs> <laughs> That's about all there is to it. How, how, do, you de how do you define national interest and, uh, and uh, national security? Well, you know, you're coming, Ken, to the, to the one point, which is finally, in a democracy, there are some things on which you have to trust a government. Yes. Otherwise, a nation cannot yes. survive. Yeah, and and if, if the Americans haven't learned that as a no, result no, of the last well, ten years, the then it makes them makes us, their friends and allies, despair of it. How do you make the division between what is obviously necessary to know, as distinct from, and what categories would you seek to see reserved from use, kept secret? Well, I. First of all, I think one has to make a distinction between what the government should tell the public and what civil servants should have the right to tell uh, the public. I believe that it is imperative for presidents or prime ministers and other leading cabinet members to give the public the fullest possible explanation of what they are doing uh, and to, to do it uh, with revealing as many of the choices they think they have and the reasons why they have chosen as they have as possible. 
the other hand, if every official believes that when he loses an internal argument, he can then peddle his paper to the newspapers, uh, it has a disintegrating impact uh, on the government. Now, I have sympathy for what Kay said, that it ought to be the government's responsibility to be able to keep it secret and not the newspapers. And how you bring about the degree of discipline, which I think is needed, uh, I have not really thought through. But I can say now, for example, when I receive a cable, which I should simply note, since I'm assuming that it will leak, I write an answer so that uh, if it leaks either to a congressional committee or to the press, I have a record of, uh, of my point of view. Now, this already distorts uh, the process of government. People ought to be able to communicate with the Secretary of State without engaging in an endless uh, internal, uh, internal debate. Many things, if you speak about the impact, and I repeat, I'm not blaming the newspapers for it, I'm simply describing the situation. The impact on the government now is that almost any paper you do that is being written for internal deliberation has to be looked at also from the point of view of how it will appear in print. And now you may say that's the way it should always be looked at. But there are many intangibles in, uh, in decision making in which it is absolutely necessary to work through candidly a number of options which you would l later uh, reject. And in which if every advisor has to worry about how he will look in print uh, three weeks later or three months later or a year later, is going to have a debilitating impact on, um, uh, on decision making. Therefore, I would think that uh, it is quite clear that the presidents, prime ministers, perhaps ought to be more candid than in the situations that you describe. But this does not, in my view, entitle officials, except under conditions of a total breakdown of public confidence, to play their own game, because what very often happens is it's precisely the people who have some some hobby horse who are uh, uh, who are pushing it most strenuously, and it is almost impossible for the press to distinguish bit, uh, between the validity of the various secret documents that are now practically being forced on them. I don't know what I would do if I were a publisher, having stated this problem. The easiest solution would be to get discipline in the government. But uh, how you can get that with all the present impact, I have no answer to. Now, if I could, since I may not get the floor again, knowing this uh, <laughs> eloquent group here, if I could make a few comments on some other things that were said here. Uh, can I, I just take you up on one point, Henry, on this? Let's take a practical. <laughs> let's, let's take a, a practical point in negotiation. <laughs> let's take a practical point in negotiation. We both know perfectly well that you can have a situation in which one side will make an advance to the other, in which if it's reciprocated, you're going to have a successful outcome and therefore you can stand the cost or the racket, whatever you like, of the advance you make. On the other hand, if you don't get the response, it's extremely damaging to the government, the Secretary of State, the Foreign Secretary, whoever it may be. Now, that, I believe, is a crucial instance where if the press come to know about it, there is a very heavy responsibility on them not to publish that because it endangers the success of the operation, because the other side is also in the position that if they respond and don't get success, they're in danger as well. Now, if this is known in State Department and the Foreign Office, or Cato, or say, wherever you like, and the whole thing is likely to be blown, and there is no responsibility in the press, you won't get initiatives. Initiatives like the Bay of Pigs? Like what? Like the Bay of Pigs. I think that the initiative you mentioned that was, a, was also not the best. Operation. And if it had been successful, we should never have heard anything but praise for it. Yeah, I, I, think I, back the back I think I better get, get you back to, a, to attack Shirley Williams. No, I was uh, going to make a, a 
partially irrelevant points to, our, to, to the one our discussion has now reached. I don't believe that the intelligence investigations necessarily prove the influence of the press one way or the other. Uh, with respect to a point that Kay made on, uh, on the Pentagon Papers, uh, I think the government got itself into a hopeless position when it was forced to defend the secrecy of individual papers that extended over a period of years uh, because it was quite impossible to demonstrate in any individual case the uh, secret aspect of uh, uh, of uh, the paper. In fact, the mere requirement of forcing the government to prove why something is secret and thereby revealing the secret will make the government most reluctant to contest uh, to contest the case. The impact of the Pentagon Papers was the cumulative nature of 40 volumes of secret documents being able to be published and the, the caution that must have inspired in other governments and their ability to deal frankly with the United States and also for opening the floodgates for the sort of situation that now exists and which in my view has to be brought under control after the election in which almost every civil servant feels free to to go public with any point of view that he may have had that he on which he was overruled or uses either the press or the Congress to bring pressure uh, on the administration. Now I am quite sympathetic to Case point that the primary responsibility is with the government and not with the press. But the consequences of, in the foreign policy field, I would agree with Ted. Would you not also say that the government itself releases confidential documents when it wants to sell its point of view yeah, quite know. often, Henry? And would you reserve the right to the government to use them when they saw fit, but not to the right of the government's opposition? Well, I think it one one we will have to we we should assume that the Watergate phenomenon is an exception and not the rule of government. One would one should assume that the that a, the government requires a minimum of of trust. I can give since this will not be pub, uh, will not appear for several months. Last week we have had we had a difficult situation in Lebanon, in which we were trying to evacuate Americans, uh, and in which uh, the, their departure was, was delayed. We deliberately, not because we wanted to hide anything from the public, refrained from blaming the PLO because we did not want to turn it into a test of strength uh, with the PLO, and because we thought that the lives of the people was more important than than some grandstand play. Within days, uh, it was leaked what the obstacle was, what our concern was, and until we get these people out, we still don't know whether this does not greatly complicate the issue. Now, this is a case where there's no policy dispute within the government at all, and where it's simply some official who's trying to prove to some columnist that he's a big shot and is in on some information, is releasing information that next Wednesday or Thursday uh, would do nobody any damage and there does nobody any good this way. Is that a release from the field, Henry, or from, from the State Department? Well, I, in this particular case, the State Department is guilty enough in, in these matters. In this particular case, I don't believe it came from the State Department. It came from somebody who wanted to prove how able his organization was in effecting evacuations. It was not, wasn't even malicious, it was just self-serving, but potentially very dangerous. We hope it won't be dangerous, but the reason we kept that particular sequence of events secret is, even though we revealed the general fact that we couldn't make the evacuation, the particular conditions which inhibited the evacuation, we kept secret simply so that we could complete the process, and once completed, it would be very, there'd be no objection whatever to make clear who did what to whom and what we did. 
Why uh, is the press so anxious to damage the national interest, whatever it can find? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, Dave. Okay. Why? Uh, that's that's, no, that's clear, and Ted. Really. <laughs> I don't want to. That question is obviously addressed to you, okay? So we're, we're I'm being asked if I've stopped beating my wife. <laughs>